Aloha and welcome to Figments, the Power of Imagination. I'm Dan Figleaf. Hey, did you notice that intro where they had the arrows in the middle of the target? That's because that's where I was on December 6th, 2021, when I said Onicron marked the end of the pandemic. And guess what, people, the government in particular, finally catching up with that. Um, I won't gloat too long because I have a lot to talk about today. And first, let me give for those who are tuning in for the first time, I hope there are some people who are tuning in for the first time, a little bit about myself. My name is Dan Leaf. I go by FIG because I was an Air Force fighter pilot for 33 years. I then worked in the defense industry as an executive and then came back to government to be the director of the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies here in Honolulu, where I currently live and will live forever. Well, I won't live forever, but I'll be here as long as I live. And uh, now I'm a retired sort of guy, consultant, author, commentator, and um, if, Lord willing, I'll turn 70 this year. How did that? Hey, hang on. Hello? Car warranty? Uh, no, I don't think I have a car warranty, so it couldn't have expired. So please don't call me again. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm sure you get those all the time. I do. And especially as I get older, I worry more about scams against the elderly. And they're out there. Social security account frozen. You're this, you're that. And um, I'm not scared. I love to engage the, the people who call and give them a hard time. If I can get profanity out of one of the scam callers, I feel like it's a good day. But they're out there. And the scams make me mad. And the one that makes me the maddest is the massive COVID scam being perpetrated by the United States government. I mean that. And I'll explain that in a minute. So let's talk about what today's show is going to have. Have We're going to talk about COVID, the Canadian trucker protest, and um, Russia-Ukraine. We have to talk about Russia-Ukraine because as I uh, record this on President's Day, we usually don't allude to the day of recording, but I'm looking at my TV with cable news on, and <laughs> it is not a good day for world peace or um, national sovereignty or anything else, really. So let's talk a bit about scams and why I say that. And I, I use that word advisedly. In fact, my wife, Alejandra, and I um, had a long discussion about using that word. And can you really say this is a scam? And there are two elements of scams. One is in um dishonesty and the other is defraud and yes i think you can and i'm going to share some personal experiences with that and it's all related to the closure of government offices unnecessarily and really indefinitely uh supposedly because of covid now pandemic commentary has covered everything mask mandates ad infinitum uh, the the vaccines the boosters the boosters to the boosters uh, social distancing, the various variants, and uh, the economic impacts probably should have gotten more discussion, but they're talked about. But we haven't talked about how the government has denied or delayed services to its citizens under the guise of COVID-19. And it's having a real effect on people. And if you do an internet search, let me suggest one, social security office closure. Google or any other search engine use uh, social security office cl office closure, and you'll see that it's affected a lot of people, including your host. Uh, and I'll talk about that. Now, uh, right now we're in the point of hand wringing about the Omicron variant BA.2, and yet the the pandemic is effectively over, and it's become a common endemic disease the common COVID, and even Disneyland and Disney World are opening up with fewer, even no restrictions. But the government, hmm, government, yes, government, not so much. Here's a quote from OPM.gov. <laughs> OPM, an organization I've had some dealings with. Here's the quote. Federal offices nationwide continue to perform mission critical I'm trying not to choke on that. Mission critical functions and operations as determined by agency heads. 
By the way, we didn't elect the agency heads. They were appointed. They're not accountable, but they control our access to services. So here we are on March, in March, or in February, and we've been in two full-blown years of the COVID pandemic. And for example, social security offices remain closed. You can't go to your local social security office. Um, here's the quote from, <laughs> and this is old because they closed them a long time ago. Here's the quote from the social security website. We are open to receive your calls. On Tuesday, March 17th, 2020, we suspended face-to-face -face service to the public in our field offices and hearing off hearings offices nationwide until further notice. That notice has not yet been received, by the way. However, we are still able to provide critical services via phone, fax, and online. I'd like to make two main points. One is, why are they closed? Why are they closed? Everything else is open. You can go to the gym, go to a bar, go to a restaurant, get in an airplane, go to a baseball game, go to a football game with tens of thousands of people, some with masks, some not. You can't go get government services that you pay for if you're a taxpayer. If you're not a taxpayer, please don't watch this episode because it doesn't apply to you and you don't get to be angry. Why are they closed? It's a fraud. It is specious to say they're closed for safety because, first of all, it's very, even in normal times, such as they were, it's a very controlled environment. They have a door they can lock. They are usually in a building with a metal detector and everything else. They control complete access. And government employees are required to be vaccinated. And they're at like a 90 plus percent vaccination rate. There's no danger to the government employees. They're just electing to telework. And point two, the notion that they provide the same services online or by telephone, I personally know to be baloney. I said that properly. There are other terms I'd use, but it's a lie. It's dishonest to say they provide those services. I will give you two examples. The Office of Personnel Management I deal with because I was a federal government employee for five years after my 33 years in the Air Force. And I had a change I needed to make that involved some thousands of dollars of my money that the government was taking and shouldn't have been. Not big money, especially if you're Elon Musk or Bill Gates, but kind of my money, so I wanted it. I tried to do that online and by telephone. It should have taken a week, reasonably. I submit a phone form, so, so here's the situation and why you should stop taking money out of my account. They go, yeah, you've provided the appropriate documentation and we're doing that. Instead, it took six months and a phone call a normal phone call to talk to somebody took 25 attempts. By the way, usually I had to be up at four to five in the morning. Why time? Because they're not on my time schedule. But 25 attempts. And often when I dial their phone call, their number, I'd go through the process. You know the menu of press one to be annoyed, press two to be really annoyed, et cetera. And eventually I'd put, be put on hold and hear music that I don't have on my playlist when I work out. And 10 or 15 minutes into the hold, I'd get a message that really, you know, guess what? They can't take your call. 25 attempts to get through to be told they couldn't do something. Okay, That's dishonest. Here's what's fraudulent. First of all, they're taking my money because if I had that money, I could deposit in, a, in an account and get interest. It might be pennies for me, but if you put all the me's together that are trying to get their work done with the government, that's a lot of money that we're not getting and the federal government is. So uh, I get put on hold. I finally get through. I actually talked to somebody who I assume is a human being. They could be an alien, but 
let me let's assume the best. They're actually a human being, maybe even an American. And they say, well, you know, uh, we have your request, but we've sent a request for further information by the U.S. Postal Service, not a government company, I don't think anymore, but the U.S. Postal Service. You know what that was? That was a lie. And I had that with OPM and, and Social Security, where they both alleged to have sent correspondence, either informing me of my status or requesting further information. Not true. Now, the U.S. Postal Service is not a high-performing organization, but generally I get my mail. You know, if I've got to pay my mortgage or a credit card bill or order parts for my Mustang, I'll get that mail. Why is it somebody, a representative of the Office of Personal Management and later of the Social Security Administration would told me, oh, we mailed it to you, and it never came, never. <laughs> How does that happen? <laughs> it happens because it's a lie. I'm convinced of that because as I went through the six month process that should have taken a few days with OPM, eventually I pushed them enough that I'm talking about maybe a 50 hours of trying to call them and calling them. Uh, eventually I convinced them to resend their request for information. And I got it in the weird, right? Querado, as they say in Spanish, very weird that only when I was angry enough would I get this letter. By the way, it still took three weeks because it has to go through the bureaucracy. They are defrauding people. And in terms of OPM, this was kind of an annoyance. It got straightened out eventually after six months, as I said. And with Social Security, they're impacting people's lives. And if you look at it online, as I suggested, you'll find that there are a lot of people who are being denied money that allows them to pay their mortgage, get their health care, uh, get care for disabilities, life-changing costs through this fraudulent effort from the government to not work. And that's what they're doing. They're not doing their job. Now, let me go back and say that the Social Security is saga isn't quite done yet, so I'm pretty probably putting myself at risk right now of not getting my Social Security benefits, but I'll hope for the best and say that the people I've dealt with are very um, nice and kind and frustrated with their situation. They're not trying to screw us, to defraud us, to scam us, but they're stuck with where they are. And... Um, and they acknowledge, when I talk to them, they acknowledge two things. One, either that they can't do their job as described online and through the telephone, or two, that some of the online information they're providing is wrong. And in Social Security's case, the, the processing time still says on the website two to four weeks for a, a standard claim for retirement for an old geezer like me, two to four weeks. All of them will say, and well, it's really all, all of the representatives I've talked to will say it's um, uh, might be 45 days, but really it's at least 90 and don't call back until then. And we're sorry. And we they'll say we have asked our leadership to update the website, but they won't. That's a scam. Period. Plain. Simple. So why are they doing this? It isn't for health. It cannot be for health because everything is el else is open. Are they doing it to get that interest that the government gets and we don't? I don't know. Are they doing it because they know they've given their workers a benefit? They get to work from home, less supervision, less scrutiny. Frankly, it would be unreasonable to think that we're getting a full eight-hour day from telework, why, why are they doing it? The unions are a big part of that. Take a look at what's available online and that's all I'll say about that. Now I had the same experience here in Hawaii and it's a little more personal because it's here where I live. And it was simply to get an apostille, not, not money. No money was involved in this. 
and it's it's already a, go a ridiculous government process because I had to get a notarization of a notary of a notary to prove that I had no criminal record for a, a nonprofit um, thing I want to do with another country. Good thing. Try to make the world a better, more peaceful place. And that should have taken two days maximum. Had to get a certification, a, get a record, and then a certification, another certification, and another certification, but all within walking distance. But guess what? Here's what it says about the Hawaii State Capitol. By order of the state controller, the Hawaii State Capitol is currently closed to the public due to the COVID-19 pandemic. No date on this. But they do do their operations online and via email. Maloney. The online instructions are ridiculous. If you call them or email them, you'll get garbled data back and you'll do what I did. You'll go back and forth many times trying to figure out what you need and get it done. And don't even suggest that you drop a document off in purpose no, or in person. No, it must be delivered by the U.S. Postal Service, which apparently isn't reliable for, from OPM or USPS, but for the state, it's okay. Why am I bringing this up? Because it, it is an even more striking illustration of the fraudulent nature of these claims by government organizations that they need to be closed. Not only is everything else open and opening, further reopening, but the Hawaii state employees at the Capitol got priority over people like me, an old guy with risk factors, not horrible, but they got priority over us when the vaccine came out. So they could telework safely. I'm pretty sure that these state employees are out in the community like I am. They can be at their work, at their office, at the Capitol. What reason is there to not do it? Now, this one is probably not as finan financial, but it, maybe it's more convenient to them. They don't have to struggle in our somewhat legendary traffic to get to work. But, dude, why aren't they at work? Well, if you close the capital, you have less oversight. And as we've seen with a couple of very disturbing corruption cases, maybe less oversight is good for the government. It's not good for the citizen, and this should stop immediately. So that is my get off my lawn statement. I, I'm mad about this because it doesn't really hurt me. I'm, I'm not missing mortgage payments because I haven't received my Social Security uh, benefits yet. I'm not homeless or hungry because of that. But I'm absolutely certain that some people are. And that's wrong. And it shouldn't be the case. Let me take a break and a breath here. Man, I chewed up some time with that, but I feel very strongly about this. This is a scam. It shouldn't happen. All right, next week, next week, next week on Figments, the power of imagination. I may have a guest. I hope I have to call and send a text. But I'm going to talk about North Korea because by then, Whatever chocolate mess has happened in, Korea, in uh, the Ukraine will have revealed itself. And we'll be able to talk more about North Korea's um, recent uh, activities, missile tests, et cetera, and why they do it. I think that's a very important discussion. Why is North Korea doing that? So um, in the meantime, for the rest of today's episode, let's talk about two more cases, and I'll go into less detail. And these are kind of head scratchers for me. Um, one is the Canadian truckers protest. And I am very much intrigued by this because it's, it's kind of mm, different, right? You've got workers protesting against a liberal government, a, a significantly less left-wing government. This is odd. It's not the norm. And I'm not an expert on Canadian uh, law, and I'm not a Canadian. Uh, Max, our engineer today, shout out to Max, is in fact a Canadian citizen. Uh, but why is this? Why, first of all, it, has this protest gotten such an aggressive response from the Trudeau government? 
Um, and why are they doing it? And what in heaven's name would compel uh, use of the Emergencies Act? Because the Emergencies Act is a big deal. The uh, Canadian Emergencies Act, and I know that Canadian law is different. They don't have all of the protections that we do. Um, but the Emergencies Act is a big deal, and it's been used, as far as I know, never. It wasn't used on September 11th, by the way, when we diverted hundreds, maybe even thousands of airplanes into Canada. Um, it's used for things that seriously endanger, seriously endanger Canada. Okay, those are the words that matter. Seriously endanger Canada, not annoy citizens of Ottawa, not disrupt commerce, but seriously used several times in there. Affect the sovereignty, the security, and territorial integrity of Canada. I've watched these truckers on TV, and it doesn't look like that to me. Uh, again, I'm not an expert, uh, but this concerns me. Why does it concern me, the use of the Emergencies Act? Uh, and why does it concern me as an American who lives pretty far away in Hawaii? Uh, it, it, it concerns me because of what they've done financially, what the Canadian government has done financially. As part of this, they've taken uh, financial measures to do two things, freeze or sanction protesters. Okay, I, that doesn't sound right to me. And actually either um, divert or deter donations to support the protesters who, whose primary crime, as far as I can tell, is disagreeing with the government isn't quite that simple, but they disagree with the government. So they're going to sanction them. They're going to freeze their bank accounts, take their assets, repossess their truck or whatever. Doesn't sound right. Sounds extreme for a not so extreme situation. Not violent. And this could happen here, folks. Because there's likely to be a trucker protest in March maybe a drive to the to Washington, D.C. So watch this space, because if a similar overreaction occurs, we're on the precipice of a transition to a far more authoritarian government. That's not a political statement, because it's not. It's about how do you respond to difficult situations? and uh, what seems to be an extreme overreaction from the Trudeau government is a lesson for the American citizen. I'm concerned. Speaking about being concerned, I'm really concerned about Ukraine, but who the heck isn't? Um, in today's news, again, we shouldn't uh, tie this to date, but it's President's Day, and today, President Putin of Russia has said he's going to recognize as independent two regions in eastern Ukraine. Holy crap. I've got a bunch of outcomes here. None, let me tell you which one isn't going to happen. Nothing happens isn't going to happen. Uh, Russia could relent right here. They could stop right here, but, but they've already gained some sort of a concession because nothing bad has happened yet. Um, for them, they, they've done this despite the threat of sanctions, despite tough talk. Uh, and they've and Putin has said that he will send forces as peacekeepers to these now independent states. This could lead to a major incursion, a minor incursion, a real war, and it could have global uh, effects global sequels, I call them there. So how does China look at this gambit by Putin, which seems like it's going to be successful, and then adjust their own activities, their own pretty aggressive activities in with regard to Taiwan yeah, and elsewhere in Asia? The, nothing good is going to come of this, and nothing good is going to come of this because we ceded the initiative. We, NATO and the United States, not fought a war for NATO, so I think I can speak for NATO. 
I'm not under that, not a spokesman, but we, we gave up the initiative. We said, boy, it sure seems like he's going to attack. It might be a minor incursion. And boy, we are going to be mad as heck, but we're not mad yet, but we're going to be. Uh, clearly, that did not deter President Putin. It's unlikely to deter President Xi. These are dangerous times that will have an effect because even the sanctions could affect your average American citizen. Be ready for some shock and awe the next time, well, maybe not the next time, but two or three tanks of gas when you take your car with its expired warranty to fill it up, be ready for some shock and awe because this will affect us. And it doesn't make a rat's hind end to Vladimir Putin. And I suspect it means precious little to Xi Jinping, giving those autocrats freedom of operation is a very dangerous thing. We'll have more on that later. I'm worried I, I have nothing, I, I don't I have a nice President's Day is about all I can say, but these are dangerous times. So we always close with what would FIG do? Number one, regarding the office closure scams, contact your elected representatives and tell them to give us what we're paying for. We're paying for government service. And if I can go to a stadium with 70,000 people or get in an airplane or go have a Mai Tai on the beach, or let's say indoors, I ought to be able to go to my local government uh, office and get things done. Two, vote. Three, think about security. Because security is now global, and I don't care what part of the country you live in, but things like Ukraine affect your life. So think about security. You don't have to be an expert, but you should at least know what matters. Ukraine matters. Taiwan matters. And we should be concerned. I'll see you in a couple of weeks on Pigments, the Power of Imagination. I'd like to thank Think Tech. Think Tech Hawaii is a great organization that gives citizen uh, journalists like me a chance to speak our mind. And I'm glad I got to speak my mind today. I feel better already. Aloha and mahalo. Mm -hmm.